I've been talking about this for a while and I think it's finally time to take a look at Fortress in Pokemon Crystal. This Pokemon has been a bit of an enigma for me. You only see it during the Koga battle in the Elite Four, it's always annoying, it's pretty tanky, and I've wanted to put it to the test. So let's see how it does on its own start to finish. Welcome back to the channel where I like to do solo challenges with the ultimate goal of ranking Pokemon after a series of runs and optimizations. And Crystal runs are going to be changing up just a little bit, I'll go into that soon. And if you want to know more detailed information about the runs in general, just check out the description. There's lots of information there. And if you are a returning subscriber like Nintendork1983, I appreciate the support, but grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's just jump right in. Let's start the story of Fortress by going over some information. And when you look at these stats, three things kind of jumped out to me. First is that defense, 140. It's absurdly high. When you combine that with the 45 base HP, it means I get to say the word bulky 45 times in a video again. Second is that 90 base attack. It's pretty great. I can really work with that, but the looming problem is that 40 base speed. It's it's really no surprise at this point. Game Freak strikes again. They make another Gen 2 Pokemon incredibly slow. I got my shocked Pikachu face on. Now let's take a deep breath and let's just appreciate how normal this level up learn set is. I will say this is more of a problem with just Gen 2 and how they handle move diversity. There's five damaging bug moves. There's three damaging steel moves. And this thing doesn't really have a tail. It doesn't have claws, wings, a horn, or needle-like projectiles. So I guess I get it. But Game Freak does at least have the decency to give you self-destruct as a starting move just to kind of give you a way out of this nightmare if you need it. For TMs, you get some standard things, but notice the only coverage moves we get are Rollout, pretty good, Rock Smash with its incredible 20 base power, and then you get Giga Drain in the Kanto section, and then you get Solar Beam later when you get Whirlpool if you need that. To top it all off, Fortress is a bug and steel type Pokemon, and that's an excellent combination. I can't speak highly enough of this. It's one of those top combinations that give you just a ton of resistances and it makes everything else in the entire game neutral with the sole exception of fire. We are double weak to that, but let's just kind of toss that to the side. We'll worry about it later. Let's just kind of get on with the run. For the rival, Cyndaquil is going to be the obvious choice, and thankfully there's no fire moves just yet, so we just tackle this thing down, and let's just, let me get this out of the way. Pokemon Crystal has amazing sprites, and to this day I still find them to be some of the best in the series, but I want you guys to look at Fortress's back sprite. It truly looks like a tiny little walnut, barely, just barely peeking over the screen. What would you guys rate this back sprite out of 10? You also might have noticed that we've been grinding a few wild Pokemon here and there. So let's kind of skip ahead to when we wrap up this first couple of routes of the game. There's a clear goal here and it's to get halfway through, roughly halfway through level 9 before tackling the Sprout Tower. The main reason for the earlier grinding is to be able to make it through the tower and pick up some optional battles. Now if you came here immediately after only doing the rival battle, you just simply would not have enough tackles to make it to the end and it just becomes overall inefficient. Now by the time you make it to the end here, you can see that I'm fighting Sage Lee and at the very end of this fight I'm only going to have three tackles left left and keep in mind that tackle can miss so this was just a pretty good attempt overall now by the time i'm done with the bird keepers in faulkner's gym i hit level 13 and that's going to take us to the first gym leader battle Strap yourself in guys, the AI, it sees that Mudslap does the most damage, and that's not great. It's not a great position to be in. Now level 13 makes this a very easy two shot, and it gives you your best chance just to quickly get past Pidgey, and here today we're going to see the worst case scenario. If you like birds, you might enjoy this one because it goes on forever. I get really unlucky here, I miss on the first Mudslap debuff tackle, and that really just it snowballs into a spiral of depression. Remember that one accuracy debuff in Gen 2 is only 75% as opposed to Gen 1 66%, so it's really not that bad in theory, but I just get really bad luck here and it takes me about 32 turns to finally take out this lowly little Pidgey. The only silver lining here is that Pidgeotto knows Gust, it's neutral due to our topping, but it does do more damage than Mud Slap, so there's no more mud humiliation for us. And even though I eventually do outlast this battle, you can just see how close this was by the end of it. Now let me just reiterate this here, I had a really unlucky battle against Faulkner. It did not go this way in practice, and in fact you can actually get through this battle pretty comfortably at level 10 without too much struggle, but I thought that I would go to level 13 just to make it more consistent. It wasn't, but it is what it is, what can you do about it? Now to follow up a trend that we've been doing for the last couple of videos, I'm going to backtrack already and pick up the pink bow. 
Now the colors of Fortress's Gen 2 Sprite and the pink bow, they kind of clash, but that's all right. It still looks great. And after that, I am going to go pick up the Hardstone to the left of Violet forward later. After that, I'm going to go pick up the majority of battles on Route 32. Overall, there's going to be six extra battles I'm going to pick up here. They aren't that interesting, so we're not really going to take a look at them. There's also some other things that we're not going to look at too much. It's the extra battles in Union Cave. There's two of those. Then we're going to do the Slowpoke Well, and we're going to find ourselves in Bugsy's Gym, where I'm going to battle every single trainer in here as well. And we can just skip ahead to Bugsy. And it's going to be an extremely easy fight, as evident as me going into this fight, I'm low, I don't care, and I'm still using recoil moves. I do get low, I, I cut this one a lot closer than you would like, but I really wasn't worried at all. And I hit level 20 at the end. I get the second badge, and now my friends, we have to talk about a huge problem. Fortress hits a brick wall here, and let me just kind of summarize it up as quick as possible. Rival number two has a ghost type on his team, he leads with a ghastly, and we only have normal moves. You don't get access to mud slap, we don't get fury cutter, and we are just in this awful position here, and I want to talk about it for a bit because to me, this defines Fortress's run. I've said Fortress's too much, and it just sounds weird now. Adding that apostrophe S just it isn't doing it for me. So initially in blind test runs, just messing around, my generation one focused brain thought that this run was over. Even if we got to struggle strats, I thought, hey, struggle's a normal move, and it would just be like a gen one Caterpie or Magikarp run. The run would end here. But as we all know, struggle was actually topless starting in gen two, and that's going to be the play here. Now, the second problem is depleting your PP. We have self-destruct on the learn set and obviously if you use self-destruct you just die and you go back to the Pokemon Center and you're gonna have full PP all over again. The solution here is to level up until you get a fifth move that can replace self-destruct and what we have on display today is a very carefully constructed method to try to make this as efficient as possible but it's still gonna be very tedious so let's just kind of break it down. Tackle and take down they have 55 combined power points. Now when you take into account things like tackle having less than 100 percent accuracy takedown having even less accuracy at 85 percent and maybe like the odd chance that a wild pokemon might survive a hit you want to hit the next move in about 45 wild battles now we get the next move at level 22 we're going to deplete the pp when we get it and boom problem solved right now everything from the early wild battles to the extra battles in sprout tower extra trading on route 32 union cave bugsy's gym it put me in this range while i hit level 22 around the time my power points are getting low and I'm just I'm not sure there's a better way to do this and I thought about this a lot literally just laying awake in bed at night wondering how what's the best way to solve this problem ultimately there's more things to worry about there's more problems the first one is rapid spin it's a really weak 20 base power move but for some reason it has a massive 40 power points and you also have to take into account that level 22 on its own is not enough for the rival battle but we'll go into that later and I guess I'm gonna be boring for a minute I'm gonna talk about some crystal chain we have we have a ton of downtime here and during the Umbreon video I did talk about this a little bit so here's what we changed you might have noticed on the top right it just says game time now and we are doing today's run using in game time as the metric not only that I'm back to times three speed as opposed to times four speed now I'm not sure how many of you actually play along or do these kind of runs on your own time but times four speed in crystal feels god awful it doesn't feel good if somebody says it feels good they're lying to you they only do it just to save time over world movement it feels too fast to be accurate bike movement is incredibly clunky menuing is a nightmare and even things like choosing the flight path location it just feels off and I'm, I'm gonna dial it back so I can be more calculated more precise and just keep the flow of the game moving better in fact after after doing a lot of times three testing since the last run I would say that there's not gonna be a gigantic difference in total time and that's just due to how much more efficient everything is overall but that's kind of like an analysis for another day Outside of that, I have made some little ROM tweaks, such as making HM Pokemon more efficient and guaranteed. And I would say overall, I just kind of looked into the game and practiced the game a lot more. Now, lowering the speed, it does make the runs take a little bit longer, but it's really not as long as you would think. For the reasons I mentioned earlier, like more precise menuing and better overworld movement, it's not really that bad. But for me personally, I think it's a necessary step to take just to make these games more in line and more accurate for a future tier list. But I don't want to lose all the viewers I'm just sitting here talking about little boring minute details let's kind of get back to the run so when we finally get rid of all the rapid spin PP just this little detour alone takes around 31 minutes and 30 seconds of in-game time and that's a good chunk of time but you also got to take into account the 
the other dozen or so battles I did to get to 20 after Bugsy. And I guess you can clearly see wh why I'm gonna say that this part of the run just killed the momentum of this Pokemon. But we still have a long way to go. But let's go over that second rival battle. Now this one, it needed an intro given the time sink. And the question here is gonna be if struggle is actually the answer for the ghost type, and the answer is yes. But there was a bigger problem here I haven't talked about yet. Level 23 is necessary here because it puts us at 35 speed, and you're gonna see that Quilava has 34. If you did not outspeed it, it would get off two double super effective fire moves, and you'd be kind of sitting here left wondering where your life went wrong. But even with that extra speed, you're gonna see how close it kind of gets here. But when we finally get that threat down, there's only a Zubat in the back standing in our way, so that means that this battle is over. This was a doozy to figure out and just kind of like putting together the puzzle pieces to make the most out of the situation Fortress was in. But let me use this time to say that I don't want you to judge this run completely just off of this. Was this part great? Absolutely not. But I need you to remember that Gen 2 is a really long game. To give you some more perspective, the Gen 1 speedrun world record is 1 hour and 44 minutes. And when you look at runs like Mewtwo, I got those runs down to like 1 hour and 53 minutes. Now to contrast that, the Gen 2 speedrun world record is three hours and eight minutes and in that game they actually use a manip to get a massively over leveled legendary that's level 40 when you get to ecrity so the solo run's likely going to be a little bit longer but what i am saying is that runs if they have like a rough patch early they do have a chance to make up a lot of time just because it's a long run they don't have to be bad just because they have a bad part in the run but i guess this is the first run under these new metrics i'm just saying let's be optimistic about it unlike lantern we do get access to headbutt but since we don't done some extra grinding we got some extra levels we actually don't even need it i'm gonna skip it and that's because we have takedown this is a good spot to talk about that just a little more now i'm on record as hating this move i think it's awful 85 percent accuracy with recoil damage it just never felt good until this this very run i guess it's gonna be really situational but when you get this move before the second gym it does hit pretty hard when you have decent attack i still think in the grand scheme of things this move is pretty bad but when you get it early it's not that bad at all and I actually use it a good bit in this run, so there's some more positivity for you guys. That's why you always gotta test things out. The main reason to just not get headbutt at all outside of just saving a little time was that our friendship is actually pretty high and we're about to get a couple of moves that can just replace takedown anyway. So I didn't see any reasoning to get it. Now we're entering that part of the game that has got a lot of busy work in it. We've been over it, I don't wanna cover it all, but finally getting the bike and actually having accurate control over it was pretty exciting to me to see how it would all work out. The days of just kind of like erratically driving around like a maniac or things of the past and I'm all for it. Something else I'd like to bring up real quick is spinner manipulation. There's a pretty simple manip that they use in the speedruns to bypass the spinners and I've actually gotten pretty proficient at it. I'll talk about my thoughts as we battle my boy juggler Erwin here with the level 2 Voltorb but the reason I'm not going to really show it off in today's video is because Fortress just needs to do these battles. At the moment I don't really have any plans to like modify the spinners because I think the manip's pretty easy. But it's worth bringing up. It's a, like one of those little interesting things I've been kind of figuring out. Next up, we get access to rollout. Having something that does something other than normal damage is great, but remember that our only weakness is fire, and having that rock damage gives us some like elite coverage. It's about the best coverage you could get with this Pokemon. And I always kind of tell myself, rollout is not that good of a move. I don't think it's that good. And then I do runs that use rollout, and I always sit there and think, man, rollout's pretty good. But we're just gonna jump straight into Whitney to kind of just show you why I shouldn't think that. That. And I guess the only problem I have with the move and probably what everybody has a problem with is the 90% accuracy. It doesn't feel great. It misses at key moments. But in terms of this battle, I'm going to get to ramp up two turns of rollout on the Clefairy. So by the time the mill tank comes in, I'm already pretty much hitting like a truck. So that means the mill tank's going to go down swiftly. It just can't compete. And this one's over incredibly quick. I was pretty impressed by this. Now we're going to jump straight ahead to the next rival battle in Ecritique. And usually you would avoid this. We'll talk about that more in a second. Now for Haunter, it does use Curse. Not great. You don't want to see it, but we start the rollout here. Now, even at half health, it can still survive one. That means we use two rollouts. We're on our third. It's super boosted right now. We outspeed Quilava, and we don't have to worry about the fire damage because we can just easily take it out in one hit. And what ends up happening here, and this is why rollout is such a significant power boost for Fortress with its 90 base attack, is that we just kind of clean sweep. We just keep rolling out, and that's the battle over just like that. 
So this is impressive, and I'll just talk about this right now, because a lot of Pokemon, even like pretty good Pokemon, have to kind of route a little bit different. They have, you know, they struggle on the rival, or they struggle on Morty, and they need to go to the right here, and go ahead and go down to the lighthouse, get some extra battles, and then come back here later. But Fortress, you notice here on the clip here, I'm walking straight down to Morty. I don't have to skip anything, and we can actually just dive straight into the next gym. We equipped the Hearthstone before this battle, and I think you guys know where this is going. We're going to use Rollout. Get ready for a lot of Rollout strategies for this run. The idea is simple, set up Rollout, get super powerful, and just sweep everything, but the Ghastly, unfortunately, it barely survives. It gets off Curse, which means we're on a clock. But I can't, let me just, I, the, for the last time in the video, I'm going to reiterate this. 90 base attack with a Rollout that starts to getting to plus 3 and 4 and 5, it hits like an absolute truck. And I guess like always, the only risk of doing this fight now is if you maybe you get hit with the hypnosis you fall asleep and you just can't wake up but it does miss here and the thing about rollout is if it's hitting your opponents are on the clock and that's what happens to morty here i kind of just sweep it retrus goes into a little ball and he's just knocking down these ghosts and i really don't want to be a broken record here but i just kind of like when i watch back the footage and i'm just like doing the editing and doing the voiceover right now i just can't help but think that if this pokemon got mud slap we might actually see a pretty good run today so it's just a it's a tragedy that we had to waste so much time getting to those struggle strats earlier but it is what it is let's keep the run moving so we're down in olivine we're doing all the usual busy work strength surf crabby lighthouse we're doing all that stuff no need to really look at it it's all very trivial and easy but you might be surprised that today we're already taking a swift a real brisk swim down to cinnabar and this is what i said this is what i really mean when i say fortress is pretty impressive because we've seen the runs like even like pretty solid runs they say hey i don't want to face chuck yet or hey i can't face morty yet i'm gonna go off do a couple of side things use abra's teleport to make it not cost that much time but fortress i just i can't get over how it can just do the standard path when way better pokemon can't even do it i think it's just kind of cool and before you know it it's time for a little bit of chuck brother and let's just take a look at the fourth gym Notice I was able to pick up the mint berry just in case Chuck decided that accuracy doesn't apply to him anymore. But let me just reiterate here how good the bug and steel typing is. Everything but fire is either resisted or it's neutral. Now this combined with that beefy defense stat means that I don't have much to worry about at the start. And it's kind of why Fortress can just casually come here and get this out of the way without much thought. When it comes to Polyrath, it has mostly inaccurate moves you already know. And even though you're not going to see me get the range here, Takedown does have a pretty solid two-shot range, so I go for it. I don't get it here, but Polyrath, it just misses some hypnosis. But remember that even if it hit, I do have that Mint Berry to nullify it. And just like that, fifth badge down. This gives us access to fly, so we can backtrack. We can pick up a few rare candies and some other little goodies. But let's skip ahead to the Lake of Rage. And usually we come here before we get fly, but since we got it in today's run, we can look at a little time skip that I actually like a lot. Also, let me kind of insert this here. I'm pretty sure I said Briss swim down to Cinnabar earlier. I meant Cyanwood. You already know. I'm not going to re-record it. But you can just surf right here. You can save a little time. You can kind of work your way up to hidden power. You can get things like the rare candy and the elixir. And before I continue this little line of thinking here, let's cover hidden power real quick. For today's run, it's going to be ground. I think it's the best choice because rock and ground, such a good combination. They cover so many matchups. It also uses our physical attack and Fortress doesn't get Earthquake and Gen 2. It does get Earthquake in later generations, but Game Freak just, it wouldn't allow it back in these days. It was too much. Fortress would just be too good. But let's go back to what I was talking about a second ago. Now with Fly, you can just use it. You can just immediately fly back to the Lake of Rage, even though you're already there. You'll be right in front of the Gyarados and you can just get to this part extremely efficient. But you know what this is going to lead to. We all know the rocket hideout section. We absolutely love this section of the game, but don't be too let down because we're going to skip over it with the magic of video editing and let's just kind of hop into the next gym. When it comes to price, I have one word, rollout. It's super effective on two of his three Pokemon and we just need to get it going here. We resist ice, new everything else is pretty much neutral. There's not really much more to say. It's another badge. Now just to sprinkle in some more thoughts after doing Fortress runs, is that regardless of that awful grind for rival number two, and what we might see at the end of the run when everything's said and done, 
This Pokemon's not bad, and I would go as far to say that it felt pretty good at a lot of points. If you take a run like Gramble, I would say that run's pretty elite, but it needed to maneuver around Chuck and take some alternate paths. But Fortress just, it impresses me with how it could do the bare minimum and still follow the optimal path during these sections. That's gonna take us straight to Jasmine. We got Hidden Power Ground. This one's pretty straightforward and simple. Magnemites, they're a one shot. And once again, our topping's gonna be a huge benefit against Steelix. In contrast to something like Umbreon that we've seen on the last Crystal video, it still got really low just because of the bulk of Steelix and the raw power of Iron Tail. But Fortress just makes this one look easy. That's the seventh badge. And oh God, you already know what that means. It's that time of the video. We get that dreaded phone call. It's informing us that Team Rocket has done the takeover on the radio tower. And unlike the last Crystal Run, I don't have any PP problems. I actually planned this out pretty well so we can actually just skip this part just like the good Lord intended. So we're moving ahead to Ice Cave here. I pick up Rest. I didn't need it in any of my practice runs, but after kind of underestimating Lance on my last run, I didn't want to get caught with my pants down around my ankles again. So this was more of a safety strat if anything. It doesn't really take any extra time so I just pick it up because why not. I actually forgot to buy vitamins right after the rocket takeover so I do fly back to Goldenrod after I get to Blackthorn and let me talk about another cool little overlay change I made. Now if you're someone that watches the streams you might have already seen this but I repurposed the stage modifier box to show how many vitamins I can use when I'm at a certain position on the map in the overworld. This is just really helpful for blind runs and generally you can try to really plan out your vitamin usage and I do during my runs but there are just countless times where I'm planning on using four carbos and it actually turns out I can only use three so I have to kind of reload and, or waste some money and it just really helps with accuracy and it's really kind of done in a non-intrusive way but as far as actual vitamins go carbos is the really big important one that we need here and I just have a lot of money so I kind of just round out the rest skipping straight ahead to Claire. Level 48 would be ideal, but I'm a little bit short of that and I don't want to waste any more time trying to grind or anything like that. But the main thing that only being level 47 does is makes the Dragonairs only have a 61% chance to be a one shot. So if I miss the range like I do on the second Dragonair, it has a chance to use Thunder Wave. Luckily it just misses. I take it out. We hit level 48. So that means the third one's going to be a guaranteed one shot. And at the end is Kingdra. It's a pretty comfortable two shot. I do outspeed it as well. So that means it pretty much gets one move off. It goes for a smoke screen, it fails, and that's the fight over. And ultimately, that's going to be the Johto badge portion of the game down. Before we even think about the Elite Four, I do have to do some cleanup. We have to pick up a couple of things that I skipped, and the first order of business is going to be to make our way over to the World Islands. I'm going to grab the rare candy in here. It's pretty quick. It doesn't take that long at all. And now we're going to make our way over to Mount Mortar. There are two important things here. The first is going to be the other rare candy. Also fairly quick to get as well, but the second thing is going to be the TM for Defense Curl. Now, I want to I want to take this time to talk about Rollout for just a little bit, because I feel like I often just kind of gloss over it, but it's a very interesting move. Rollout lasts for five turns, and each turn it doubles in power. This means you go from 30 power on the first turn up to 60, 120, then you go to 240, so on and so forth, you get the idea. When you use Defense Curl, your Rollout starts at 60 power, which means it's going to get out of control pretty fast, and if you really really want to know the fifth turn of rollout after you use a defense curl is 960 base power which is a pretty ludicrous number and keep in mind that that's only base power it's not taking into account maybe stab damage held items or something like the rock boosting badge from Brock and just to kind of give you guys a statistic of how absurd 960 base power is let's just say that it's a shade lower than being six and a half times stronger than hyper beam just imagine for a single second and just imagine being hit with six and a half hyper beams at once, guys. But yeah, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit, but defense curl, candies, we get it. Let's move on. Going towards Victory Road, I don't do anything extra. I could skip the spinners here, but I do need them to hit a very specific level in the Elite Four. We don't need to really take a look at the rival. It's pretty easy. That means it's time to fade to black. And let's take a proper look at the Elite Four.
first up is Wheel, and we have a great matchup here, and in theory, Rollout should just dominate this fight. The problem is that I'm sacrificing some consistency for speed, and I open myself up to some bad luck. I get Confused Raid, and I'm hitting myself multiple times here. I'm struggling to set up the Defense Curl into Rollout. That means I take an absolute beating here, and by the time I make it through the Zod 2, I'm only at 44 HP, which isn't looking great. I'm outsped by the next Zod 2, I take more chip damage, then I take out the slow bro coming in next, and finally at the end, the faster Jinx just deals the finishing blow, and it gives Fortress its first reset of the run, but I would say pretty good job for making it this far, I'm not too worried about it. On the second attempt, this one ultimately just comes down to me not hurting myself as much. This means by the time we make it to the end of the battle, I have a bigger health reserve, and it allows me to barely survive a hit from Jinx to deliver the final blow, and finally, we can just move on to the next member. Koga's up next, and rock damage, it's great here. Now on top of that, Hidden Power's neutral damage is really good for chipping down the enemy fortress, and then it can do super effective damage to Muck, and we don't really need to linger here. It is what it is, a bunch of bugs, we got rock damage, ground damage, it's quick, it's easy. Let's talk about Bruno for a second. The bug in steel typing is coming through clutch once again, fighting is only neutral, and you gotta take into account that Bruno's team is pretty much full physical damage focused, and we have that extreme defense stat. We just have a pretty good matchup here. Now Hitmonchan does have Fire Punch, but it's Hitmonchan. It's like getting hit with a little piece of paper. And you are going to see Machamp's Cross Chop crit here. It's going to do some really big damage, but this little nut is pretty resilient. And at this point, at the very end, Onyx is only left, and it has negative five attacks, so it can try to knock me out even though I'm really low and I get really low here, but that seals the deal. That's three battles down. Now after the battle, we're going to have to slow it down, we're going to have to talk about something real quick. Now to this point, things have been pretty great considering, but there are going to be several moments from now until the end of the run that just boil down to if we outspeed or not. If we don't outspeed, we die. Simple as that. Karen's Houndoom has 106 speed, and there's no universe where we will ever survive the flamethrower. Now when you have 15 dbs in speed, you have stat experience, and you use seven rare candies at level 53 like we're gonna do here, you can hit level 60 and that'll allow you to outspeed it. Now this isn't the last time we're gonna talk about fire damage or just the general problems that it's gonna pose for the routing of this run, but thankfully here, you only have to do just a few routing tweaks to let us kinda perfectly fit the puzzle piece into place here. And you might be wondering here, why don't I just grind trainers? And let me just quickly say that training in Gen 2 games is awful and it's very slow. Using candies now and just training later at the end of the game it's much superior but let's not talk about that now let's get on with it I've, I've held off long enough Umbreon is first and what you really don't want to see what you really don't want to have to deal with here is sand attack and surprise surprise we see it here immediately and I just have to say looking back on the footage and everything I had a lot of bad luck on this run just look how long this battle takes it's giving me like PTSD flashbacks to Faulkner's Pidgey earlier in the run but you got to remain positive maybe you got to think hey maybe all the bad luck is out of our system now because it's going to be now or never with Houndoom coming in it's looking to heat things up and we're going to see the worst case scenario we missed the hidden power because of the sand attack and we get hit with a flamethrower that's pretty much enough to kill my entire nutty family line it forces a second reset and there's there's really just nothing you can do about that on the second attempt we take another sand attack and I try not to be a negative person but sometimes and, and tell me if I'm alone in this sometimes you can just feel something coming and I already knew that I was gonna miss the next hidden power but we do get to see a full power flamethrower here it takes us from 100% health to zero with ease so that's the danger of fire on the third attempt Umbreon in the game it finally decides that I've had enough so it lets Umbreon miss the sand attack but keep in mind that even with the sand attack debuff I still have a 75% chance to hit hidden power so it's just a shame that I magically missed every time but let's not get salty let's actually get happy because we're gonna get to see this hidden power demolish the Houndoom and there's a little tear streaming down my cheek right now from here, the battle's over. We only needed to get level 60 because of the binary nature of speed. We needed to outspeed that Houndoom. So we're more than strong enough just to brute force the rest of the spot. Even in the absolute worst case scenario where maybe we get paralyzed, we get cursed, we take a ton of damage, then Murkrow comes in and pecks away at us for 17 turns, I still think we would win. But it's good to have this one over with. Let's get on to the champion. We've seen similar Lance fights play out in other runs, but Rollout is really great here. Gyarados is generally going to prioritize Rain Dance, 
So that lets us set up the defense curl, start the rollout. We can take it out. And Lance is going to send in another fire type. Charizard here has 108 speed and so do we. This means there's a 50-50 shot, so it's perfect. So perfect, in fact, it's almost as if it's a planned out and an optimized run. But here I lose the speed tie. It goes for flamethrower, but remember, rain dance is up. And I can actually survive, so this is perfect. But of course... Of course, it gets the burn proc, and that makes this battle basically over. Now, it looks pretty good at this footage. You're going to watch it right here, and you're going to say, hey, it looks pretty good. Even with the burn having our attack, rollout still takes out pretty much his entire team. But when we get to the Aerodactyl, this is where it's going to catch up to us. Resisted returns aren't going to be enough, and I can't really set up defense curl and start rolling out with the chip damage. We got burn procs coming in. I just don't have enough help to make it through, so we have another reset here. On the second attempt, there's no rain dance. So that means we actually need to win the speed tie here. So when Charizard finally comes in, we actually get a, for the first time in this run, we get a coin flip to go our way. I win that speed tie and rollout does what it does. Rock double super effective against Charizard. It's over with. Now from there, my rollout isn't going to last for the rest of the fight. And there are some threats you can think about, maybe like a thunder wave. But when we're this healthy, I can just really just push my way through this fight. And the outcome of the battle was pretty much inevitable. That means that Fortress finishes the Elite. Four. I'm going to start taking this time by going over some split data. Uh, the format here should be pretty self-explanatory. Splits on the side, time in the middle, difference in time on the right. The time difference at the very end is going to be color-coded. Most of them is just going to be crystal color, but I do have two standouts in red and green. That's going to be the slowest and fastest split. I think it's pretty obvious that the slowest split is going to be the time from Bugsy to Whitney. That's where we had to do that insane grind to get rid of our PP and use struggle strats on rival number two. So no surprise that's the slowest split. The fastest split is going to be price to jasmine and what you really might notice here is that the second fastest split is actually the elite four start to the elite four end and that just kind of gives you some factual data on why you probably shouldn't hoard your rare candies for the end of the game imagine how much faster this really efficient grinding would be if you had like an extra five or ten more levels but i digress maybe we'll talk about that more later but this is the overall split data to this point this is the state of fortress we still have a little bit to go so i think it's time we just take a look at kanto I think we all know how the Kanto section goes by now, and you might be surprised that Fortress just, it doesn't struggle at all during this time. Now, if you want to know, if you were playing like times four speed, this would take roughly 20 minutes, but we're doing things a little bit different today. I follow the standard route, there's no deviations, and when we look at the split data at the end, you kind of get a good idea of how in-game time works for this. I am going to be making the decision to kind of consolidate all the Kanto gems into one split, because that just kind of makes the most sense to me, but you'll just have to see it later. Now, there's not much to say here, but just to cover all my bases you might say to yourself hey what about Blaine he's a fire gym leader you've had some fire problems surely he's gonna be tough and you'd be wrong like I said in other videos Kanto gym leaders they're just rarely tough maybe blue is sometimes but if you can make it through the elite four the first seven gym leaders in Kanto are almost always a joke and you're just gonna see me one shot everything here but let's start to talk about some actual deviation so our fire problems they aren't over and looking ahead to blue we are going to have to be over 130 speed or we're just gonna lose Arcanine is going to beat us 100 out of 100 times and I need to do one quick pit stop to redo the Elite Four to get us where we need to be. The decision to forego all the extra training in the game earlier, use candies to overcome challenges like Houndoom, and just grinding the Elite Four later in the game at this point in time is just, it's far and away the most efficient method. I think you can look back at things like the Umbreon run and see that despite banning Curse, I was still able to get around a one hour and 30 minute real time run, and I'm fairly confident with this strat overall. All the problems that we had during the first Elite Four visit, they're now gone. It's very quick, really efficient. We get that over with, and we're gonna use two rare candies here, and we can just dive into blue. There's no reason for an intro today because there's not much tension here. There's no real threat to speak of. You probably should deposit all your HM Pokemon just to kind of avoid like whirlwind annoyance, but you, you start the rollout. You take out the Pidgeot and Arcanine's gonna come in second. We outspeed now, so rollout's already in pretty much in full effect. And I'll say that rock damage in general is just really good for blue. Rhydon is the only Pokemon that resists it, and he's gonna try to save Rhydon for the very end of the fight, but with a ton of bulk and all the threats out of the way, Fortress has just pretty much got the all clear here. It's gonna work its way through the spot. It's gonna claim that 16th and final badge. 
Now this is where we're gonna get to some more changes. Normally we're gonna time the blue split and we judge a Pokemon based off of that because I'm not a huge fan of the difficulty jump when you get to the red fight, but I've had a change of heart lately. We're going to just start timing the full game. And for this run, the red fight is really interesting and I need to talk about it before we actually dive in. Speed has been a really important theme for the run. It's been at the forefront and with a massive jump in levels on red's team, it means we pretty much have the ultimate fire type to worry about. So you might be wondering, what's Charizard speed? It's 179. I'm really close to a level up here, so I'm gonna battle like one or two wild Pokemon. We'll hit level 73. We got one more rare candy to find, and we'll be at level 74. And at that level, Fortress will be at 136 speed. That's a long way away. How I normally route runs is the test levels and see when I can outspeed. And guys, imagine my horror when I sit down and I discovered that a perfect speed DV Fortress with like 50,000 speed stat experience, it would need to hit level 100 to get to 180 speed. So it goes without saying that hitting level 100 is not an option. It would completely destroy a run's time. It just wouldn't be very good. So now it's time to maybe talk about an alternative method and we're gonna flash back to something that I didn't really mention earlier. After Whitney, I went to National Park and I picked up the Quick Claw. This held item, it gives you a 23% chance just to go first. And overall, when you average everything out, I think it's gonna be a much faster method to slay the figurative dragon and get through this run about 26 levels sooner than it would otherwise be possible. But that's the setup for the final fight. I had to at least lay that out for you. There's gonna be a lot of luck involved here, but let's just take a deep breath. And let's see how it works out for Fortress in the final battle atop Mount Silver. First up is Pikachu, and this little rat is the worst. It might surprise you that this is going to be the worst part of the fight, and this is where the vast majority of resets are going to take place. If it uses Charm, you should just reset, and I do here. You're going to see me do it several times. It cripples your damage, and it's just, it pretty much a death sentence to any Pokemon that wants to do physical damage here. The second thing to talk about is Thunder. It's neutral damage, and it only has a 30% chance to paralyze, but I swear to God it paralyzed me every single time that it used it. So what we are kind of left with here is a battle that's like really front loaded. We're outsped from the start. We immediately get our attack neutered or we get paralyzed. And it's really frustrating, but there's really no real alternative here since we are so slow, but we still want to get the fastest time. So just to keep this going, let's take a look at an attempt where I get paralyzed, but I still progress. We can finally take a look at a different Pokemon. Venusaur has a pretty god awful matchup against Fortress, but it just really wants to set up Sunny Day just to give Charizard an extreme overkill against us, but this is our chance to start that rollout. The better play, and you'll see me do this later, is to chip down the Venusaur first with like return and then start your rollout. But you can see here with the paralysis that it actually starts to do some pretty solid chip damage to us. But when it's all said and done, we are on the fourth rollout and we can finally see what we thought was going to be the final boss initially before we realized it was Pikachu all along. And what this comes down to is simple, Quick Claw. We don't get it here, but even if we did, we took a ton of damage already. We missed time the rollout on Venusaur, but that's the first time we made it deeper into the fight. So skipping ahead a couple of attempts, we're gonna see a quick claw proc on Pikachu to get us through instantly. And you can see, here's how you should handle Venusaur. Hit it with return, use a defense curl, go into the Charizard with the boosted rollout, but you already know what we need. Will we get the quick claw here? The answer is no. And I think at this point, we have a great understanding of what needs to happen here in this fight. Now, I wish I had better in-between footage to show you, but let's skip all the way to reset number 21. And the battle starts out really great. Quick claw proc, return, moves us on to the Venusaur. Things don't go perfect here. The idea, we've already talked about it, you chip it down, maybe one rollout can take it out, and you'll have a potential four more rollouts for the rest of the team just to sweep. But sometimes Venusaur will start to just use synthesis, and it really stalls out the fight. At the end of the day, I used more rollouts here than I would like, but that really isn't that important. Let's kind of bring in the Charizard. And here we're gonna see like some of the most wacky little set of events that was honestly a roller coaster of emotions for me. I actually get the quick claw proc here, but I missed the rollout. It's actually pretty sad, but Charizard goes for fire spin, it misses as well. And at this point, I know I probably missed my one opportunity here. We're gonna have to reset. And you can see me kind of linger on the menu in disbelief, but I just play it out like I always do. I select rollout and I actually get the second quick claw proc. But the question is, 
if a non-defense curled first turn rollout is enough to one shot it and it is so let's see if we've finally done it now since our rollout isn't that strong yet snorlax will not be a one shot but it just goes for amnesia on its turn and the second rollout is enough to progress the fight then comes in blastoise it uses whirlpool it traps us but what blastoise doesn't realize is that it's trapped in here with fortress and a massive rollout knocks out the tanky turtle and we are looking ahead at the very end of the fight there's light at the end of this tunnel but espion does move first psychic does enough damage to where it puts us on the brink of death but we have one more rollout it hits and nothing can stop fortress from completing its destiny and finishing the run now this was a little unorthodox but quick claw really came through and it makes me wonder if this is what was the answer for steelix but i'm not going to worry about that just yet let's take a look at the final split data for the run and you can see the kanto gym section it's actually it's technically the longest split but since it encompasses the time that i finished lance all the way up until when i beat blue it makes a lot of sense because it covers eight badges on its own now let me know what you think about seeing split data because i really don't have to show it or i could start showing it earlier in the video but feedback is always welcome our final time today is five hours 23 minutes and 26 seconds and this kind of this video marks like a soft reboot for my crystal runs i'm going to need more data before i can get that zero to 100 scale tier card Hard working I'm likely gonna need to know what the top run is what a good run is what a mid run is and I can start to work a formula based around that but this is a good start despite all the awful rival number two struggles and some late game problems with speed and fire types this run was actually better than I thought it would be I had a lot of fun but I am glad to just move on from it I'm interested to see where we're gonna ultimately land on a letter grade here but I'm not worried about it at the moment special shout out to my channel members and patreons the support means a lot and if you made it this far in the video I really do appreciate it comment real one down below and if you are new to the channel check out the playlist subscribe do all that kind of good stuff but that's about all I have for you today. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.